Pauperism and Free Trade, The Approaching Commercial Crisis by Karl Marx, published October 15, 1852. In a malt house in Banbury, Mr. Henley, president of the Board of Trade, lately explained to his assembled farming friends that pauperism had decreased but by circumstances which had nothing to do with free trade, and above all, by the famine of Ireland, the discovery of gold abroad, British shipping, the exodus of Ireland, the great demand consequent thereon for British shipping, and etc., and etc., we must confess that the famine is quite as radical a remedy against pauperism as arsenic is against rats. At least, observes the London economist, the Tories must admit the existing prosperity and its natural result, the empty workhouses. The economist then attempts to prove to this incredulous president of the Board of Trade that workhouses have emptied themselves in consequence of free trade, and that if free trade is allowed to take its full development, they are likely to disappear altogether from British soil. It is a pity that the economist's statistics do not prove what they are intended to prove. Modern industry and commerce, it is well known, pass through periodical cycles from five to seven years in which they, in regular succession, go through the different states of quiescence, next improvement, growing confidence, activity, prosperity, excitement, over-trading, convulsion, pressure, stagnation, distress, ending again in quiescence. Recollecting this fact, we will revert to the statistics of the economist. From 1834, when the sum expended for the relief of the poor amounted to £6,317,255, it fell to a minimum of £4,044,741 in 1837. From that date, it rose again every year until 1843, when it reached £5,208,027. In 1844, 45, and 46, it again fell to £4,954,204, and rose again in 1847 and 48, in which latter year it amounted to £6,180,764 almost as high as in 1834 before the introduction of the new poor law. In 1849, 50, 51, and 52, it fell again to £4,724,619. But the period of 1834 to 37 was a period of prosperity. That of 1834 to 42, a period of crisis and stagnation, 1843 to 46, a period of prosperity, 1847 and 48, a period of crisis and stagnation, and 1849 to 52, again a period of prosperity. What then proves these statistics? In the best of cases, the commonplace tautology that British pauperism rises and falls with the alternate periods of stagnation and prosperity independently of either free trade or protection. Nay, in the free trade year of 1852, we find the poor law expenditures higher by £679,878 than in the year of protection 1837 in spite of the Irish famine, the nuggets of Australia, and the steady stream of immigration. Another British free trade paper attempts to prove that exports rise with free trade, and prosperity with exports, and that with prosperity pauperism must decrease and finally disappear, and the following figures are to prove this. The number of able-bodied humans doomed to subsist by parish support was, January 1st, 1849, in 590 unions, 201,644, January 1st, 1850, in 606 unions, 181,159. January 1st, 1851, in 606 unions, 154,525. Comparing herewith the export lists, we find for exports of British and Irish manufacturers, 1848, 48,946,395 pounds, 1859, 58,910,833 pounds, 1850, 65,756,035 pounds. And what proves this table? 
an increase of exports of 9,964,438 pounds redeemed above 200,000 persons from pauperism in 1849. A further increase of 6,845,202 pounds redeemed 26,634 more in 1850. Now, even supposing free trade to do entirely away with the industrial cycles and their vicissitudes, then the redemption of the total number of able-bodied paupers would, under the present system, require an additional increase of foreign trade of 50 million annually. That is to say, an increase of near 100%. And these sober-minded bourgeois statisticians have the courage to speak of utopists. Verily, there are no greater utopists in existence than these bourgeois optimists. I have just got hold of the documents published by the Poor Law Board. They prove indeed that we are experiencing a numerical decrease of paupers against 1848 and 51. But... From these papers there follows at the same time, from 1841 to 44, the average of paupers was 1,431,571. 1845 to 48, it was 1,600,257. In 1850, there were 1,809,308 paupers receiving indoor and outdoor relief, and in 1851, they numbered... 1,600,329, or rather, more than the average of 1845 to 48. Now, if we compare these numbers with the population as verified by the census, we find that there were in 1841 to 48, 89 paupers to every 1,000 of the population, and 90 in 1851. Thus, in reality, pauperism has increased above the average of 1841 to 48, and that in spite of free trade, famine, prosperity, in spite of the nuggets of Australia, and the stream of immigration. I may notice on this occasion that the number of criminals has increased also, and a glance at the Lancet, a medical journal, shows that the adulteration and poisoning of articles of food has hitherto kept up a pace with free trade. Every week the Lancet causes a new panic in London by unraveling the fresh mysteries. This paper has established a complete commission of inquiry of physicians, chemists, and etc. for the examination of the articles of food sold in London, poisoned coffee, poisoned tea, poisoned vinegar. Poisoned cayenne, poisoned pickles, everything mixed up with poison that is the regular winding up of the reports of this commission. Either side of bourgeois commercial policy, free trade or protection, is of course equally incapable of doing away with facts that are the mere necessary and natural results of the economic base of bourgeois society. And a matter of a million paupers in the British workhouses is as inseparable from British prosperity as the existence of 8 to 20 millions in gold in the British Bank of England. This one settled in reply to the bourgeois fantists, who on one hand hold up as a result of free trade what is mere necessary concomitance of every period of prosperity in the commercial cycles, or who, on the other hand, expect things from bourgeois prosperity which it cannot possibly bring about. This once settled, there can be no doubt that the year 1852 is one of the most single years of prosperity England ever enjoyed. The public revenue, in spite of the repeal of the window tax, the shipping returns, the export lists, the quotations of the money market, above all, the unprecedented activity in the manufacturing districts, bears an irrefutable testimony to this fact. But the most superficial knowledge of commercial history from the beginning of the 19th century suffices to convince anybody that the moment is approaching when the commercial cycle will enter the phase of excitement, in order thence to pass over to those of over-speculation and convulsion. Not at all, shout the bourgeois optimists. In no previous period of prosperity was there less speculation than in the present one. Our present prosperity is founded upon the production of articles of immediate usefulness, which enter into consumption almost as rapidly as they can be brought to market, which leave the producer an adequate profit and stimulate renewed and enlarged production. In other words, what distinguishes the present prosperity is the fact that existing surplus capital has thrown and is throwing itself directly into industrial production. 
According to the late report of Mr. Leonard Horner, Inspector General of Factories, there took place in 1851 an increase in cotton factories alone equal to 3,717 horsepower. His enumeration of factories in course of construction is almost endless. Here's a spinning mill with 150 horsepower. There, a weaving shed for 600 looms for colored goods. Another spinning factory for 6,000 spindles and 620 horsepower. Another for spinning and weaving with 200. Another with 300 horsepower, etc., etc. The largest, however, is building near Bradford, Yorkshire, for the manufacture of alpaca and mixed goods. Quote, the magnitude of this concern, which is being erected for Mr. Titus Salt, may be inferred from the fact that it is calculated to cover six statue acres of ground. The principal building will be a massive stone edifice of considerable architectural pretensions, having a single room in it, 540 feet long, and the machinery will include the latest inventions of acknowledged merit. The engines to move this immense mass of machinery are being made by Messrs. Fairbairn of Manchester, and they are calculated to work 1,200 horsepower. The gas work alone will be equal to those of a small town, and will be erected upon White's hydrocarbon system. At the cost of 4,000 pounds, it is calculated that 5,000 lights will be required, consuming 100,000 cubic feet of gas per diem. In addition to this extensive factory, Mr. Salt is building 700 cottages for the workpeople in its immediate neighborhood. End quote. What then follows this enormous investment of capital for immediate industrial production? By no means, but on the contrary, that it will take a far more dangerous character than in 1847, when it was more commercial and monetary and industrial. This time, it will fall with the heaviest weight upon the manufacturing districts. Let the unequaled stagnation of 1838 to 42 be recalled to mind, which too was a direct result of industrial overproduction. The more surplus capital concentrates itself in industrial production instead of dividing its stream amongst the manifold channels of speculation, the more extensive, the more lasting, the more direct will the crisis fall upon the working masses and upon the very elite of the middle class. And if in the moment of revulsion, the whole overwhelming mass of goods on the market already takes at once the form of lumbering ballasts, how much more must these be the case with these numerous enlarged or newly erected factories just far enough advanced to begin to work, and for which it is of vital importance to set to work at once? If every time when capital deserts its habitual commercial channels of circulation, this desertion creates a panic which reaches even into the parlor of the Bank of England, how much more so a similar sauve-qui-peur in a moment when the immense amount has thus been turned into fixed capital in the shape of mills, machinery, etc., etc., which begin to work only at the outbreak of the crisis, or which partly require further sums of circulating capital before they can be got into workable condition. I take from the friend of India another fact significant to the character of the approaching crisis. From a statement from the commerce of Calcutta in 1852 therein contained, it results that the value of cotton goods, twist and yarn imported into Calcutta in 1851, amounted to four million seventy-four thousand pounds, or nearly two-thirds of the whole trade. In this year, the whole amount of these imports will be larger still. The imports into Bombay, Madras, Singapore are not even comprised herein. But the crisis of 1847 has given such revelations of Indian trade that nobody can retain the slightest doubt of the final results of the industrial prosperity in which the imports of our Indian empire counts for two-thirds of the whole. So much as to the character of the state of convulsion which is to follow in the wake of the present state of prosperity, that this convulsion will come down in 1853 is prognosticated by many symptoms, especially the plethora of gold at the Bank of England, and the particular circumstances under which the large influx of bullion takes place. At this moment, there are 21,353 pounds in bullion in the vaults of the Bank of England. It has been attempted to explain this influx by the surplus production of gold in Australia and California. A simple glance at facts proves the incorrectness of this view. 
The increased quantity of bullion in the Bank of England represents in reality nothing but the diminishing import of other commodities, in other words, a large surplus of exports over imports. The last trade list shows in fact a considerable decrease of imports in hemp, sugar, tea, tobacco, wines, wool, grains, oil, coca, flour, indigo, hides, potato, bacon, pork, butter, cheese, hams, lard, rice, and almost all manufactures of the European continent and of British India. There was an evident over-importation in 1850 and 1851, and this, as well as an increase of price of breadstuffs on the continent in consequence of a bad harvest, tends to keep down imports. The imports of cotton and flax alone show an increase. This surplus of exports over imports explain why the rate of exchange is favorable for England. On the other hand, the balancing by gold of this excess of exports causes a large portion of British capital to lie idle and go to increase the reserves of the banks. The banks, as well as private individuals, hunt up every means to invest this idle capital, hence the present abundance of loanable capital and the low rate of interest. First-class paper is at one and three-fourth and two percent. Now, if you compare any history of trade, say, Cook's history of prices, you find the coincidence of these symptoms. Unusual accumulation of bullion in the cellars of the Bank of England, excess of exports over imports, favorable rate of exchange, abundance of loanable capital, and low rate of interest, regularly opens in the commercial cycle, that phase where prosperity passes into excitement where on one hand over-trading in imports, on the other wild speculation in all sorts of attractive bubbles, is sure to begin, but this state of excitement itself is only the precursor of the state of convulsion. Excitement is the highest apex of prosperity. It does not produce the crisis, but it provokes its outbreak. I know very well that the official economical fortune-tellers of England will consider this view exceedingly heterodox. But when, since Prosperity Robinson, the famous Chancellor of the Exchequer, who in 1825, just before the appearance of the crisis, opened Parliament with the prophecy of immense unshakable prosperity, when have these bourgeois optimists ever foreseen or predicted a crisis? There never was a single period of prosperity, but they profited by the occasion to prove that this time the metal was without a reserve, that the inexorable fate was this time subdued, and on the day when the crisis broke out, they held themselves harmless by chastising trade and industry with moral commonplace preaching against want of foresight and caution. The peculiar state of politics created by this momentary commercial and industrial prosperity will form the subject of my next letter.